Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Al Salviti of Regiment Blades. You probably know Regiment Blades from their famous low-vis design. It's a dedicated self-defense knife that in many ways resembles a gun. It's got a blade to handle angle that looks kind of like a revolver and it features a retention ring where you would find a trigger guard. Al is an expert in the Filipino martial arts and has been training people who really need to know how to fight with a knife since the early 2000s. He's no stranger to the dark realities of knife violence and any glorified notions of knife fighting you might have will go right out the window when you scroll through his Instagram page. We'll meet Al and discuss Regiment Blades, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, download the show to your favorite podcast app, and share it with a friend. Uh, and in the meantime, if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Al, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. It's great to see you. Thanks, Bob. Glad to be here. It's my pleasure. Well, I said a lot in your intro there, but you've been training in knife combatives and knife fighting and Kali and all sorts of Filipino martial arts and other stuff for quite a while, but how did you get into this stuff? All right. So I've been training for 51 years, December 10th. I know that because I have a certificate, right? So <laughs> I, I started uh, training, of course, like everybody in the seventies after Bruce Lee movie, everybody wanted to be Bruce Lee. And then I started training uh, in 1973. It's old style, take on, turned into Taekwondo. It's a real old style. So at 19, I got a black belt in that style and um from there at 21 i started bouncing my uncle had a club and you know i was a black belt and i fought all over i fought Madison square garden and you know, all that stuff but there was all mostly point stuff okay like joe rogan did he did a lot of point stuff when he was younger so i get into working nightclubs and i'm working in pennsville new jersey uh Bruce Willis used to come in all the time at that time when nobody knew him before he moved to New York when he's a little wild, but off the subject. So anyway, so I get there and I'm up to me, a pretty well-trained black belt. I mean, I trained with a Korean guy six hours a day, five days a week, you know, and I thought I was the shit. Okay. So I get in there and in the first night, Everybody's laughing at me. I'm 5'7", 140, right? So I'm like, man, nobody's really. And they're all monsters. You know, the bouncers are monsters. So I get in there, and the first night, nothing's happening. And they're introducing me as, you know, this is the owner's nephew. He's going he's gonna <laughs> to work the door. Mm, okay, and they're laughing. I'm like, man, something's going to happen, you know. So anyway, at the end of the night, something happens, and... Um, I pulled the Bruce Lee move, which I shouldn't have done back then, but I was young, 19, uh, 21. And uh, the head bouncer, who was the meanest person I ever met in my life, he was just the meanest person. Anyway, he had somebody up against the wall, and I kicked the guy in the face over his shoulder. And they, well, so, well, what, what was that? So, so that point I was in, right? He goes, but it was Bruce Lee stuff, shouldn't have did it. But after that, I found out that most of the stuff that I learned doesn't work. It doesn't work because they didn't, first of all, they didn't know I was a black belt. So nobody had respect for me. Like, it's not like you go to a school and the black belts are like, they don't know. No one cared. The best move was a two-handed choke and bang their, bang their head on the door frame. That That's it. And just start slugging it out. So there was one guy that worked there was a Navy boxer. And he was knocking people out so fast. It was so much quicker than I would. Uh, even attempt to do because when you're in a bar with 800 people, you can't kick. It's, it's too close. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had to use your hands a lot. So I started boxing and I'd say at about 22. 
And I started going into Philadelphia, which is a fight town back then. And you're talking 81. Okay. So uh, let's go to Marty Feldman's gym. And um, the guy that has the brass knuckle event, David Feldman, that's his father. So he he was there. And I know him. And, you know, everybody's tight knit in, in Philadelphia. But we're in West Philadelphia where the signs on the door, trespassers will be killed. I mean, it was right <laughs> under the L. You know, it, it's a tough neighborhood. Second floor gym where you had to, like, watch where you walked. You would fall through the floor. It wasn't a real razzle-dazzle place. All right? Being one of the only two white guys in there, they beat the hell out of you. And, and being a black belt, too, I'm thinking, man, I can handle it. No way. It's, it, not boxing. Not at that time. So <clears throat> I started sparring with Johnny Carter, who was uh, – a a professional fighter at the time, but they didn't tell me that at first. They're like, Hey kid, you, how, how much you weigh? Oh, I don't know. 140. It's like, you want to support that guy? So how well, he weighs 117 pounds. I'm like 117 pounds. My sister weighs that. Yeah. Okay. I get in there. This dude beat me like a drum, 117 pounds. I couldn't touch him. I mean, I couldn't, t- if I hit that, he was just fade away. He was like a ghost. And it was a light, it's life changing because after all that training and all that black belt, and even some street fighting, he was so smooth. Well, he's number one contender in the world, but they didn't tell me that. They, you know, they left that out because nobody's going to box with him. So I sparred with him for six months. I learned more from him by getting beat up than any training that I ever got anywhere. He would hit me so much, you could swear there's somebody else in the ring. It hit you. But after a while, I was able to hit him because only because I knew him. You know, you get to feel the person. He was a great dude, you know, and I used to drive him home and stuff. So we got to be friends. So but after you know somebody for a while, uh, you, you know what they're going to do. You're going to do. But everybody else I sparred, I beat the hell out of because of him. So sometimes I couldn't leave the gym for an hour. I have to sit down and my head would I couldn't drive. I mean, there was no holding back in the boxing gym. So that's the difference between a karate school and a boxing gym. Well, I was going to ask you, in terms in terms of technique, what are the kind of things that were lacking in your um, you kept calling it Bruce Lee stuff. But, you know, we're talking uh, kicking and punching and all the sort of Asian martial artsy things that we think of. Uh, What was lacking in that that uh, boxing had? Was it just grit? Well, a lot of it's grit. But getting punched. See, it's always mo- how much you can take. It's really not how much you can give. It's really how much you can take. So in boxing, you had to take a lot. So the movement, that was huge. Feeling like I was never close enough to him to hit him. And then when I would step forward, he was gone. And then I was getting hit from the side. I didn't even mm-hmm. could see it after a while. Um, and there was more of a ring manipulation because it still was a sport. And, you know, I felt like if I got him in the corner, maybe kicked him in the legs a few times. Yeah, maybe. But to get to that corner, I would have to eat a lot of punches. Mm. And at 117 pounds, you can't imagine how hard that he someone could hit like that. Because I'm thinking there's I mean, he didn't never knock me out or down, but I was out on my feet a, a, quite a few times. And I can never go more than seven rounds with him. So and that's a full on pro. I mean, he was number one contender and the pace was amazing. So that's another thing. The pace of boxing is amazing. In three minutes, you say, I'm dead tired on my feet. I can't move. I can't even raise my arms. Yeah. And you got 14 more rounds to go. And you got 14 more. I mean, uh, it's amazing. So how did, how did knives come into this for you? Okay. So uh, I bounced for 15 years, right? So who bounces for 15 years? Well, I was there to fight. Okay, so after I got the boxing down and I'm training, I'm there to fight. It's, it's like going to a training school. I mean, the bar I worked in, we we wrapped our hands. So imagine going into a bar where the bouncers <laughs> all wrapped our hands. That's how many fights that I would be in a night. Okay, I mean, it's craziness. So I had a kid in the 90. Uh, when he was 10, I started. Well, he's been training all his life, but I wanted to get him formal training because I'm not big on formal training, but depends where you send him to. So it's going to be me. But then we got involved with Sayok when he was 10. 
and um, that was the Sayak dudes were they were just my type of people. I was looking. so for people who don't know who's what Sayak. So Chris Sayak, uh, Art of the Blade, Chris Sayak to uh, Tom Kyer, um Filipino, Filipino colleague, right? Filipino martial arts. Okay, high level like Takeda. I mean, it's uh, practically the same. Okay, uh, they had their own system, but it was more. See, so what people don't get about the knife training culture is Sayok was a state of mind more than the blade or more than the, um, you know, they do the transition drills and they do, you know, the angle attacks and that it was, it, that's not it. it. If you are thinking like boxing and knife fighting is, is this and not this, well then you're reading the wrong book. Okay. It's not about that. It's about, uh, being able to control yourself. If you can't control yourself, how are you going to control anybody else? Was their basic thing. So with Sayok, you were pressed a lot. Um, training modifiers is what they call it. And usually you were getting flogged. You were getting darts thrown at you. You were getting the just crazy stuff. And I loved it. And that, that was these are my kind of people. So we started training with Blade. And um, STG is a, a part of SAIC at the time that we train military. So uh, I, I went with the military because my specialty started going in power hitting and how to hit hard in a small space. And that's the people that I trained here. And I would train SAIC guys too. So uh, after the first initial uh, one, they brought me uh, J.D. Patinsky, who's a northern ring guy. Uh, he was going for selection, and they would bring people over in this training area. It doesn't look like this, how it usually looks. And before they would go to se selection, they would go through some stuff that they would think that they would need for selection. And one of the times it was like, out, take them through a, a boxing workout. And I was like, well, I don't really do boxing workout anymore. I do kind of a power thing on how to hit hard in a in a small space because it's all about power. I mean, if you don't have any power, it, it's, it doesn't go fast. You need to hurt people quickly. Okay. So this is what I developed. So anyway, after that, they would take me on the trips to the military because they had the contracts for Navy SEALs, Delta Force, the Rangers. And uh, I would do my block and my block was the open hand power hitting. And it's called the plumber slap through that community because I'm a plumber by trade and that's just a hell of a nickname. So, but we did the blade with them too. So, um, we were, my son and I moved up the ranks. Um, they would have associate instructors, but then you, to be full instructor, that's a 10 year gig. So it really took a wrong time. They were great with knives. I mean, I couldn't touch these guys. You're talking about guys. the the Sayak guys still, the right? Sayak, Sayak guys, any Filipino, and the same with the Paquita guys. You just, it was amazing when you don't know, and then there's somebody in front of you with a knife, and then all, and magically, it, you're, they're touching you with this, and it's just, uh, you really know how much you don't know. But when I started doing my thing of the the punching and the power comp, they they couldn't touch me because we were trained on two different things i had the 20 years experience of the brutality of street fighting boxing and getting beat up most of the time and they had being raised with knives all their lives and and they concentrated on on that so when we sort of traded if you want to call it i couldn't touch them but then when that knife was gone they couldn't touch me they couldn't handle it so after a while i i would go on these military trips right and I would see these guys, and they'd have these big blades strapped to their chest, you know, and all their gear. And they're big, pretty big. And I'm like, man, these guys, all you guys got big knives, man. You, you know, I got them together when I went on my own. I'm like, dude, you guys are picking your knives like you're picking your dicks. I mean, you want to get, I want the biggest one I can, you know, and I give me to me black. And I said, none of you know how to use it, right? They're like, well, not really. We, I just wanted to scare people. I'm like, oh, okay. So it needs to be smaller because um, 
with Tuhan Christ was the head of Sayoc. Uh, I was his plumber. That was like being his doctor. Okay. He needed more plumbing work than, than anyone. Now he had passed maybe t eight, 10 years ago. But before that, I was at his house all the time and I talked to him for hours, you know, the, during the week. And the man was brilliant. The man could sit there and teach a class and not even get up. He, he, he didn't even get up and everybody knew. And I watched him. I was like, man, he could transfer information like nobody that I ever met. And there's only one guy in say that was able to do that after that was Tom Kyer. The method that they had to transfer information into my head is without getting up and just explaining things to me. It was amazing. And I don't think I've, I haven't met anybody like that since. So I said, look, we, we, we need to, to make a blade they can punch with. Because when, when I went to um, Dam Neck, um, all the, the, the fight room is incredible. They're all punching and kicking, punching and kicking. And then... Uh, it would do the blade stuff. And then my block was the power hitting and the movement and, you know, stuff like that. And I would help out with blade. And uh, only because of, I was with them for five or eight years doing that. But I confused more people. I could see I'm confusing these people more than anything. I'm like, man, it's really not getting it. I guess it's me. I, you know, but but blade training's hard. I mean, you got to remember stuff. And except for, you know, just the pointy end goes in him. It's just a lot different. And I would see at the end of the week, the guys that I would train, but just throw their trainers down and just start punching each other in the face. I'm like, well, why do you do that? And I'm like, well, it's kind of getting in the way. And yeah, you're right. It, a blade is, is a hindrance or it's an asset. And there's a fine line for you to make it a hindrance or an asset. Because if you want to take everybody's skill away, Boxing skills, wrestling skills, jujitsu skills, give them a knife. It's all gone because now it's just a knife. They forget everything about you can't box with it or they're not going to do it immediately. You can't wrestle with it. Can you do jujitsu with them? Now you're going to cut yourself. Yeah, it is, is a injury. So what I started designing a play for me because it was a hindrance to me too as far as being uh, self-stat issues. Because things are going 100 miles an hour. And I've been in enough fights to know that things are going 100 miles an hour and you do stuff that you're not even aware that you've done. Mm. So I want to keep some of my skills, but I still want to be able to use a knife. Because I made it for me. I'm getting older. I need that because I'm no match for the Filipino guys. And they were no match for the punching skills I had if they weren't used to it. So that's where this blade comes into and wait for exactly and i keep that so when i do that knives are about grip okay grip and about the sheath so this pinky holds the blade in place okay and all the rest wrap now if you hold it like this without your finger in the hole you feel that you feel how good that feels yeah okay this finger doesn't mean anything all right. It's more for retention, but you don't need to put that finger in to use it. Some people say, I don't like put my finger in a finger guard. OK, that's fine. But you really don't. It's really there to pull it out. That is what my first envision was to get it out, because once this blade goes in, sometimes it was hard to get out like that. And I see people leave blades in targets because they have nothing. To, you know, it just slips out. Yep. Because most knives that are made, production knives, the hands are too slippery. I've read, I have ridden that blade all the way up and cut my fingers. Mm. The, yeah. the sheath is, is too bulky. It's no good. I'm like, you know, I got to make it where I'm not going to ride the blade. And the sheath is good, like a pistol that I can carry all day long. So that's where the concept comes of this. That the draw is the same as pistol. And we made it for shooters because the up and out is the same as a gun. Pick it up straight out into the target. They already have that. Okay, so I'm already halfway there. Because once you go to people that are trained in one area, and then you try to change things and say, okay, well, now you're going to do this. So now we have a straight blade, and it's drawn like this. And now we go number one, number two, and mm. three, four, five. And then, okay, well, that offsets everything. 
because and again it's the first day again every day it's like okay now i have to practice something different so now we have to be okay we shoot her now and now we're a blade guy now and now we're doing this and then we're going to do a punching guy and now we're going to do that so you got to be too many things as far as your training now cops were the perfect example they don't have any time to train they need to know now military dude they don't they don't have time to train they need to know before I deploy how to use a blade. Okay. Well, that's easy for me. Can you, can you punch a little bit? Yeah, I can punch. Okay. Get that in your hand. And you just one, two, one, two. You don't have to do it. I teach women like this straight on, straight on. You don't have to do it. The self stab issues are not there because if I'm going to hold something in a straight blade like this, I can't. I can't box with this. I, I can't. All right. So now, all right. So I got a reverse grip. Well, once I do this, I want to do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then when I want to do that, now it's going to change me again. Okay. I want something that I can just boom, one, two, one, two, one, two, grab one, two. Three. You know, Paquita, they got drills, right? 10 count drill. Here, here's 10 count regiment drill. That's it. <laughs> okay. So for those who are, who are listening, we're holding up the regiment blades low vis model. It's the, it's the knife I described in the intro. It's, it's got a, almost a 90 degree arc to it. Yep. It, it, it presents a lot like a pistol. It's even got a hole where the trigger guard would be. Right. And, um, I am, I am not someone who daily carries a pistol. Uh, but I have found that carrying this, um, it's very easy to draw, very intuitive. And, uh, the blade, uh, presents to the angle of your wrist in such a way you don't have to change your wrist at all right. to get that point where you want it to go. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I just want people to know who are only listening that uh, this is something that gets the blade right where it needs to be intuitively without having to relearn uh, something. I have a spatula here. Sorry, I've got a table full of knives, but you don't have right. to like turn your wrist and figure out how you're going to get that point there. And in a moment of truth, you don't have to rejigger your reflexes to get uh, the, right. the point online. Yep. So um, for me, it's like to stab there everything, you know, that my old Korean instructor used to be like, how hard do you want to hit break there everything? I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. So whatever they put up, you can you can just stab it. OK, you go right through it straight ahead, straight ahead, straight ahead. Instead of me trying to go around all these defenses, you just go straight through it, because once I point this, you have to get around it. When you know, number one, oh, yeah, I can get in. Number two, oh, yeah, that's when they enter. But you're going to have to enter off this now. Okay, entering on a, off the point is going to be hard for you because it's just going to be so in machine. Okay, it's, it's also bad. harder to see. It's harder to perceive with your it's eyes when something's coming straight in. Because how does a guy catch arrows? You see, the guy catches arrows. He catches them off to the side all the time. He'll stand there and he'll catch him here. But when you point it here. Is right here, it becomes two, and your depth perception is way off. So yeah. the angles are, there are no angles. It's straight on. I changed them to the neck and face because this is what I want. Because naturally, when you do it in somebody's eyes, what do they do? They lean back. They have to lean back. So the jab is straight up, right at the eyes. The head goes back, and then the other hand comes in, and we're back to this again. And it, everybody can do this. Toddlers can do this. Okay, it's so easy. But get this, 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 this again. The cutting up. Well, that's hard again. Now, and and, and you know, with heavy clothes on, cutting's not. So, yeah. I, so here's the contest. We'll have a a, a contest. I'm going to stab, and you're going to cut. OK, so we'll put heavy clothes on and you get to cut me across the chest with a two inch blade, just as big as I say, three inch. And, but I'll stab. Well, who's going to take that? No one, because cutting is almost superficial with heavy clothes on. Yep. So to try to get my point across with people that cutting. Yes, it is good with a bare arm and they'll drop the knife. Maybe you can get that at something. But you cut your family. Everybody else gets stabbed. Oh, there you go. Because cutting's not that bad. Because there's timers and switches. The timers are, okay, cut the vein, 
Wait, wait, explain, uh, explain that concept, timers and switches. Timers and switches. So the timers are for when you're cutting, you'll cut a vein. You'll cut the even on the neck. And maybe depending on what you cut, there's five to 10 seconds that the guy's going to bleed out. He can still draw a gun, draw a blade. He can still kill people or be dangerous. Switches are when you stab into the arm and turn it off or you stab into the neck deep and rip out. You got three seconds. If you hit the aortic arch right here that goes from your heart and the vein goes behind your stomach, that's two and a half seconds if you sever, sever that. Okay, but I can't get to that by cutting it. I need to get to that by stabbing it. Okay, so that's the concept of timers and switches. So if you cut someone and then you squeeze them and then the blood shoots out, you, okay, maybe it'll be faster. But just because you cut someone doesn't mean that they're going to stop automatically because they're, when, as soon as the adrenaline could, gets in, everything tightens up in you anyway. Okay, from bleeding. Now you see people that get cut online and they cut, and the thing's not bleeding that much, right? It's because they're adrenalized, and all your tendons, all your veins seem to just tighten up where you don't bleed as much. It's built into us. So we got to go right to the switches. Where if I stick a blade in the nerve up here, the arm doesn't work anymore. Okay, so that's this, and that's the SAOC timers and switches. You can look that up online, and they'll explain it. Uh, maybe not a lot of better in me, but <laughs> this is good. So when you're in this situation, things happen so fast. You need to be able to get your gear out and get it into play pretty quick. You don't have to fast draw because if you're fast drawing, you're already behind the concept there. You, mm -hmm. If you need to fast draw, you've done something wrong already. You should have known already that something is in the works. You have to see the future. Now, just, oh, how, how do you see the future? And I'm like, well, when you're driving down the street and you see a guy in your neighborhood, obviously lost, right? You're what? Oh, he's lost. He don't know where he's going. Oh, or this guy, you can see he's angry. He's well, the guy's in a car, and you're able to tell what he's feeling. We're mm -hmm. able to see this dude's going to turn. I see he's going to turn. He has no turn set. But you already know. Yeah. Well, don't tell me you're not in a room full of humans and you don't know what's going to happen in a little bit when someone gets the hard eyes or now I'm a little I'm more experienced in that because when I was working the bar, I would cruise the bar and see what's going to happen. OK, when I would look for that and the telltale signs or they call it hard eyes or, uh, you know, just their body movement. I saw a guy walk by me at the door. He had a bottle in his hand in a certain way. And a, the guy next to me, I say, follow that guy. He's going to hit him with that bottle. And he looked at me like, yeah, right, sure. He cracked this dude right in the face with a bottle, cut him from here to here. I said, how would you know that? I said, well, he told me by walking by me that way. I could see him. He was beeline on this guy. He had the bottle upside down. He had, and when it's like, didn't you see it? He was like screaming at everyone. I'm going to hit this dude with a bottle. That's for that. Uh, your driving analogy is perfect because, um, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, we, we all know when we're driving down the road, down the highway, yeah. we can, uh, even if we're not thinking about it, we know what people are going to do by their micro movements uh, exactly. uh, it, with their with their car. That's that's yeah. the perfect uh, yeah. so analogy. How can you not know yeah. when that is going to happen, right? I mean, I've seen so much in bars, and, and the people that you're like, you're not psychic. People tell you exactly how they are. You just have to pay attention. All right, let's, let's attention is the biggest thing. Let's yeah. talk about the low vis. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the design uh, influence. Yeah. It's it's basically punching. Can you punch? Can you get your fist on something? Well, then you can you can land your blade. Uh, but you've you've done this. You've you've done this auto uh, not automatic, but this folding version. Oh, so the folder. Okay. Now and, the folder, of course, is modeled after this. Uh, you know, we want to make this into a folder because I want to be able to carry it. More concealed or in a pocket. But let's face it, folders, they're broken. The knives are broken. So it needs a good lock, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to, the, the first design, and I sent you videos on that. And it yeah. just wasn't working for me because the button's in the wrong place. You're squeezing the button on the first one. You're where, talking about the button lock. Yeah. The oh, button there it is. Lock. Yeah. Now, the button lock, when I've had a full grip on here, my 
fingers on the button. When I get, okay, so I say, all right, I'll get my finger on lock. I put my thumb down, it's on the button, okay? Lefties, I can feel the button. Well, here's the problem with the button. That is the, uh, that just got ready to close. I don't know how that came up. But it's, yeah, uh, yeah, no, you could see that. Yeah, uh, you your, can see Your it, right? finger or thumb is always on the button one way or another. Button. We all know button oh, lock. Oh, that's the tap, right? Well, yeah. that's closing. Now, I could say this because my name was on this blade. I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not saying this like there was a bad design because once I squeeze, you squeeze it on, oh, yeah, and now it's ready to close. Okay? So using a blade that has a button lock on it that I'm squeezing while I'm using it is not what I want. And it took the video you saw with it closing on my finger and almost cutting it off to prove yeah. it uh, before they put a lock on there. Now, if you're going fast... Not that everybody has a draw fast. You forget to put the lock on. You could still squeeze the button. So we re re we redesigned it where there's a double lock on it. And that lock automatically goes on. Okay. Now, I don't flip it. I smack it to open. Okay. Mm. So what, what it is, there's a lock on one side and a button here. And this button goes down. And this button goes in to close it. So it's a two-handed operation yeah. that when I do that, this button goes down and this button goes in, I get two hands to close it. So it's less likely to close on my hand because there's two actions involved. It's out of the way, so we don't even touch it. Yep. Okay, and that's the idea because broken knives will close and the liner lock's the worst because it jumps. Now, you can say, oh, they step. But when it hits something hard, it jumps and it closes on your hand. And this old style is a liner lock, and the button button just pushes it to the oh, side. Okay, so it's a a, uh, a button-actuated liner lock. That's yeah, kind of a so hot when thing When you're right pushing now. on the button, you're pushing on the liner. So, which, you know, they're made by people that don't use knives. They just make knives. Was that Fox? I mean, Fox knives? Fox made that? knives. And that's, the lock is their design. And... We broke with with them and my the old sales partners with them, but they still sell that. Okay, and my name's off of it. Don't want any parts of it. Now a lot of people close their hands on it and call me until that's where you jumped in a dumpster and punched this thing. Yeah, to, uh, three times and close. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It, it's not it's not what we want. Putting the other lock on there, and you saw one of them that the lock doesn't work after a while. So it's just a utility knife. But this was actually engineered by engineers, real engineers. There's a stop on the blade right there. That's not for opening the blade. Mm -hmm. That's for when I do this, it locks right in here and takes the pressure off of the lock. So it doesn't wear as much for me manhandling this thing and open it. Because I open it hard. All right. We did 10,000 times. Okay. Every time. Okay before we tested it and i test everything and you'll you know, there'll be other podcasts where you'll see all the blood and guts coming out of my hands from doing that but they need to test their knives now the biggest thing we did for this is make it a two-handed ordeal where i can get two fingers in this okay so this grip here that's a reverse grip for those listening reverse grip now what i designed that for on the low viz pro and the other one is for people that don't have a lot of blade experience, okay? And they want to do the Norman Bates thing for mostly women because you know, some women can punch, you know, okay? But most women say, you know what? They're going to take that blade off of me and then they're going to use it on me. Well, more likely than not, if you get a good grip on this, it's going to be a lot harder to get this out of your hand than a will straight blade, okay? So two fingers go in and it's for here. Okay, that's just for stabbing. Now, you can still box a little with this, but more of a jab. And I show some of that on the Instagram thing. But this is more of I can use the point here. We're hooking this way if I have to and going down. Okay, so that's what that's for. It's for people that don't have a lot of time to train. And if they want to train women to, to hold it that way. My wife carries one all the time like that. She loves it. I cut the handle. I had to cut the handle down for her, but... The two finger grip I get in all the time. Now I could shoot with this grip. I, I could do a lot of things with this grip. It's really hard. Like 
see it at night you'll never see it okay yeah. so if i go in and a guy comes up on me i'm like oh man i still had this blade it's pretty hard for them to see so i can still hold on to it okay so uh, we made that so it's easy again for anything straight to drive through the self-stab issues were really hard this is still away from me so when i stab it's more in than down even when i go down it's not when you can see it put one in your hand really that blade's away from you yeah the blade is away from you here okay i can't self-stab here or under here right but with a straight yeah. blade if someone's behind me and I, one little move one little move it's hard yeah I'll yeah say you have someone behind you choking and you're choking, gonna pull out your I knife and stab them, them in the face stick it in my neck but this yeah. i can get around it and the blade's still there i can get around i can tap my here so that's what it was all designed for that al let me ask you uh so i've seen this design before under the name kernel blades kernel blades okay well we What's started all out about? as kernel blade so when we first started in 2013 i started kernel blades okay <laughs> in here with the guys so we took on a partner. Um, I had JD from Northern Red as a partner. Took on a banker. So he used to he would come here. We vetted him for, for four years. So it's not like I picked somebody off the street. He was part of the group. And I don't know when Takeda, um, if you guys trained as a group, um, you go out to eat together. You do a lot of things together. It, it just seals the bond between everybody that's mm -hmm. training together. So after, uh, I'd say, Four years he came in and after another four years we were at colonel blade but things got squirrely and uh lie cheat and steal and, and then we had to get rid of him he was the sales guy we had to get rid of him big lawsuit um to try to get the company back but he manipulated all the paperwork where i didn't know my own company yeah um i and that happened because i trusted him so with well, my name not being on I said, well, you got to take some losses sometimes. And, you know, he's fifth in a row with people doing that kind of thing to me. But so we started over as Regiment Blades, and our partner was BCM, Bravo Company, Paul Buffoni, J.D. Patinsky, and Northern Red. So we have the same people except him. But we, I lost the name somehow through the paperwork. Okay, so we started Regiment Blades. So – they still make it. They're not still patented or not allowed, but do you ever get involved in a patent lawsuit? It's <laughs> patents are useless, number one. Okay, so we do five minutes on patents. So patents are like having kids. You do a patent, you think about it all the time. You manipulate it, you turn it, all right, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. You get a lawyer, you probably spend ten to twenty thousand dollars getting a patent. You get a patent, you get it approved. So um after they hand you a patent, the patent office goes, see you, but we don't do anything. That if somebody um, infringes on your patent, you have to go to court on your own. We don't testify. We don't do anything. The government just gives you a patent. Like, oh, okay. So patent infringement means they're going to make your product. You can only stop people from making your product. So if someone does, excuse me and you go to court the first thing they're going to do is try to make your patent invalid now i didn't even know they could do that I'm like what do you mean oh well, well just we'll just make your patent invalid and then i get a lawsuit after i complain to my ex-sales guy and the warrior poet to send him a letter say hey dude your your patent you're infringing on my patent and that's it next thing i know i'm in philadelphia court in a lawsuit they're trying to make my patent invalid i didn't even no, you could do that. And I only complained. You mean I'm not allowed to complain? And my lord, like, no, you actually you, you can't even complain about it. Because if you complain, then they have the right to try to make your patent invalid. No, like, you're kidding, right? He goes, no, nope, you're in filed a lawsuit. And Phil, you look all this stuff up. Now, everything I tell you about this is on the internet. You look it up. So I'm not, it's only defamatory if you lie about people. But I got everything to back it up. So anyway. Now you're in a patent uh, invalidation lawsuit. And I said, well, what if I don't do anything for it? They have to prove it, right? He goes, no, if you don't defend it, you're going to lose the patent. Okay. 
how much is that to defend a patent invalid every loss? Oh, it's probably like a half million dollars. Jeez. What? What? Wait, half million dollars to defend a, my patent that the government gave me. They're trying to make it invalid so they can make it without consequence. I'm like, well, how do they how do they prove it's invalid? Well, you might have mailed it at a certain time. You didn't dot this I or there was another one that they look up. And I said, well, does the patent office do they can now somebody a judge is like, well, dude, I'm not going to spend a half million dollars. You know, you're in a nice thing. Who makes that kind of money off of knives that you're going to defend it? that lawsuit, but then the next infringement lawsuit is another half million dollars on top of it or a million up to. Um, so, so you're telling me the patents are useless, right? Yeah, because anybody can make your patent invalid. Now, I would say, okay, well, hmm, how often does that happen if they go through and they say, oh, your patent's invalid? They go, oh, 85%. Eight, 85%? Wow. I'm like, well, then it's definitely not worth it. I'm not it's ridiculous. So I'd say 2 million patents a year are filed, $672 each. And then they, after they grant it, it's another $700, 50,000 a year get granted. And 97% of the patents don't make any money ever. It's a big, to me, it's a big scam. Hmm. It's re, it's useless because you can't even say, Hey, you're making my thing. Let's make his patent invalid. Now, what kind of person does that? I don't know. The guy, the guy told me he's supposed to be a big Christian, and the other guy was he was nothing. But I, I don't get it. You're making my patent. I worked so hard for that patent. I did all that, and now you want to make it so bad that you're going to make all my work invalid by a date where I didn't dot an I. Are you talking about oh. the Warrior Poet Society guy? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. No kidding. I thought he was oh, like no. He, he presents as a very stand up. Oh, he fella. does. But that's on that's online too. You can see all that. He's on there. Oh, but man. I'm saying, look, you, that guy, he used to sell the Colonel Blade, okay, before that. And I video that. And then he hooks up with the former sales guy who I'm not saying basically stole everything, but brought the Colonel Blade company down. That's his partner because they both sued me to make my patent invalid. Now, it's a whole thing of um, show me your friends or your business partners and I'll tell you what kind of person you are. We called him and told him when it just started about uh, the guy is well, we're getting rid of him. And then because of this happened, that happened, the whole company's gone. There's no money and all that. And we told him and he still went with them. And the guy was selling knives on his private uh, PayPal account. But Lovell was buying all those knives from his private PayPal account because I have his PayPal accounts and they were moving money back and forth as soon as the lawsuit started. So I don't know what kind of Christian he's it, he is. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> but I don't think Jesus would do that, you know? So that that's how that went. So now it's Regiment Blades. And there'll be a fake Colonel Blaze company out there still selling and plugging away, but they're bankers. I mean, these guys don't even get paper cuts. They've never been punched in the face. So anybody that's going to deal with them or they're dealing with white collar bankers. I mean, hmm. you know, man, that's disappointing. Cause oh, uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, not, yeah. Go ahead. not only because you trusted the dude and he oh, screwed yeah. you and then, but also, you know, warrior poet society, Oh. I, I've watched a bunch of his videos and I always thought, eh, you know, he's and, a good uh, dude. He's, yeah, what? I mean, but uh, well, anyway, uh, yeah. so uh, you also do other stuff. Uh, I want to show this off because uh, we, oh, could, we could talk for hours, but so, um, so this, so here, thing the, is, this is how sweet. this happened, right? So you're going to court a lot. I was in court for five years with the Colonel Blade stuff. Now I had thought of this concept before. It's like, I love the sock pee. I yeah. love it, but the, the sock P that's, that's a knife. French made makes it and Spartan blades makes it. Now Spartan made my first run of the current blade. Okay. Oh, so okay. I, I, you know, I, that's an old style. And to me, I had to cut the handle. Down. I just did. I didn't like it. I, so I cut half of it off, but I love a sock P only because ring retention. I just love it. So I'm thinking, well, you know, 
it's illegal, number one, it's a dagger. So that's the problem with a soft tea. Everybody's like, hey, it is a dagger. Now, I don't have a problem carrying double-edged knives or using them, but I can't get in the courthouse. I can't get on a plane. I can't get on a thing because it's out in the open. They search your bags. So I'm like, you know what? Let's put a ring on a pen. Okay, and I use it just like a soft P. Now, we made the pen shorter. Okay, so it, it's only six inches. And when I have this thing, I mean, I could work this like a soft P, like nobody's business. Okay, women like it because it's easy to use and they can just do this. There's nothing to learn. But I get in courthouses with it. They get on planes with it. <laughs> now, think of this. We made it a pen. Okay. And we made it a window breaker on one side and this pen on the other side. So when I go through courthouses, I put the pen in the, the tray. Then when I get outside, I flip it over to the, the you know, tungsten steel window breaker on the other side. So basically, is you're carrying an arrow in your pocket with a ring on it. Okay. Because it's the same size as a nine millimeter and it has the arrow tip on it. I put this through coconuts. I mean, you see the videos on the thing. So it, it can be lethal, but it could also be non-lethal on how you use it. If you want to press on people, because you press on there and grab them from the back, pull, that kind of thing. You don't have to stab people in the face all the time. You don't have to cut people all the time because courts, it's going to cost you money as much as you start going to courts for, you know, deadly assault with a deadly weapon. But it was just a pen. It's all the yeah. ring don't make it a, uh, illegal. Uh, that's what I really like about this pen is uh, how it switches roles here. Right. You just take it out and flip it around as opposed to a um, a pen where the where the ink cartridge uh, goes back into the, right. into the barrel. Stays. Yeah. So with this glass breaker end and the and the ink is inside staying nice and wet and not drying out but yep. you have all this capability here this would be oh, great yeah. to have uh you know in a car uh, get yourself out of the car if you have to yeah, or in a plane and especially on planes a lot of people send me pictures and they're looking through the ring at me you know like oh i got yeah, I on the plane that. again you know because it's, it's a non-lethal weapon i mean everything's a weapon it just depends how you use it but this yeah. is easier for me now i i keep it on the thing right here right now that's a trainer I made for the pen, for the pen. Okay, so I can actually stab stuff with it because if I really go hard on this pen, but I just cut a hole, real small hole, and I keep it right there all day. Okay, and that's what I'm talking. I get it either hand. I can get it with if I need to. So it's really made it easy to carry in a pocket. It's it's easy. If I'm at the gym, in your pocket, it's so easy because let's face it. Unarmed and useless is say was Sayox terms. Un you're unarmed, useless. I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. Unarmed and useless is the term that you should always have. And that'll help you. When you leave the house without your phone, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel that way when I leave my house unarmed. Yeah. I walk with dog armed. Okay. And I don't live in a bad neighborhood, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. It's just for me to get used to it of carrying weapons with me all the time that, you know, I don't have to use them. You know, my mindset, and I got it from Sayoc, is de-escalation is easier, okay? I'm already escalated. So yeah. when I would go and I would teach the Border Patrol, they go to Border Patrol, and up on the board is the escalation of force chart. That means he does this, you do that. He escalates to this next weapon or punching your hair. This is what you're allowed to do. But if I start at the top, what well, let's get back. Escalation is hard to do. Okay. So because you always have to follow what he's doing. You can't mm -hmm. be the feeder in the just a say off term. You can't be the feeder if you're following somebody to escalate higher oh he brings a knife you bring a gun you bring a machete you bring a bazooka blah, 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 or whatever so escalation is like there's a guy at the top of the escalator with a gun and you're coming up the escalator that bad spot right where do you want to be you want to be at the guy he's already escalated so when i go out and i leave the house i'm already escalated i'm ready to 
protect myself, whatever you want to call it, kill people, whatever. I just don't do it. That's easier than starting at the bottom of the, oh, look, I don't want any trouble. Oh, something's going to happen. I'm going to have to do something. Yes. Okay. Be at the top already and just don't do it. I'm already, I'm ready now. Okay, they, I came home again. I didn't stab. That's 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 what they say with actors. Like if if an actor is already over the top with his with his performance, right. you can bring that down. But he if, if he can't get up there in the you first place, right? So there's no going would, there. Right. So why would you go anywhere where they're teaching you escalation of force? Okay, you don't want any trouble. I don't see. I don't like this. Fan, they call this the fence in Europe. I I don't want any trouble. I I don't. Fence. That never worked for me. <laughs> you know what worked for me? Okay, let's go. I'm ready. Come on, let's go. And they're oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. This guy has his helmet on. Okay, I gotta explain that. So when I would tell these guys, they would have a team, and who gets their strength from you was would be my speech, right? I'm like, you're on a team, and you know there's one dude in there that is a ruthless killer, and everybody's glad that he is here. Mm -hmm. So they basically get their strength from him, okay? Or they help it along. Because if he wasn't there, they'd all be a little leery. Oh, man. But when Big John shows up, like, oh, shit, Big John's here. Now we got it. Yeah. It gives them more confidence, right? So when I say their helmets on, is that the last thing before they go into battle is they put their helmet on. Now they're ready. They've done their gear. They pack their bag. They put their bullets in. They put their guns on. They put their things in. They got their helmet under their arm. And before they hit that door, just like football, they put that helmet on and they're ready to fight. So once I got my helmet on, I'm ready to fight. Okay. I'm not walking around without my helmet on. Yeah. All right. So, but it's easy to just take my helmet off if nothing happens. Okay. It's easy not to murder people all day long that's easy but it's hard but all of a sudden the car in front of you gets out the guy gets out what do you do yeah well I'm not, I don't, I don't. there's a guy with when all of a sudden right now they forget everything see that's the thing about training because they all think they do all this training training and then as soon as it happens right there they blank out it's like being in a speech in school and you forget everything yeah you ever do that right or do that with somebody's in front of you with a blade no, nah, it's not time to you, do it. You right? better be able to 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 <laughs> improvise and yes, talk. But you, and... Have, you have to be first. Yeah. Right. And the reason and, and going first. Now I preach going first all the time, and everybody thinks. What do you mean I'm by that? I'm just gonna punch people in the face first. Or I'm just gonna start lighting people up and with knives. I'm like, no, 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 no. Going first means um, it's a state of mind. Number one, I'm gonna be trained. I'm gonna have my weapons. I've already went first. My helmet is on. It's already on. So I went, no matter what I do after that, you're going to be second. Because I already went first. I have everything. I'm ready. That's what it means. Yeah, I guess. Okay? You can't get just in trouble, stab everybody. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, that doesn't happen. you got to go first by being prepared. So a lot of people misconstrued that over the years until I explained it. And it makes sense to be ready when you go out instead of trying to get ready very quickly. So in addition to the, the tactical pen, right. which I think is brilliant, uh, you also have a version of the low viz yeah. that is a hundred percent plastic, even yep. including these very uh, metallic looking screws and screws. bolts. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, <laughs> whoops, tell me about this. So what came with this is, same thing. I can't get well, this was before the pen, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the the pen is in plain sight. Okay, I can bring that in plain sight. But I want when I wanted to get into uh, say baseball games, I'm gonna say our guys all put blaze in their shoes, okay, and we'll get in <laughs> and then we go in the bathroom and take everything out. You know, we're being first, right? Because we have we have weapons. We're we're not yeah. going anywhere unarmed because that was the deal. Unarmed and useless. Okay. I feel like when I go out, it's like when I leave my phone home, I feel naked and feel yeah. crazy. So I want to get in everywhere with this. Okay. But we also had to make it where it's not, it's going to be useful as yeah. far as being able to drive this through, you know, uh, sheet metal into 
two buckets at a time. I mean, listen, people realize how soft we are. It's incredible. These blades with this pinky right here. This is all G10, right? This is all G10. And I don't know if you've seen it on the Instagram. I put this through two buckets at a time. I put it through the uh, sheet metal laundry tins at a time. It's a plastic knife. Yeah. It'll go in a person. You just keep on the bare thing, your face and neck, because nobody wears armor on their face and neck, even if you have bulletproof vest on. Yeah. You still don't have it. So this gets in, passes the wand every time. Even even the sheath has no grommets on even it. Even the sheath's got nothing. It's just a it's a self-clamping sheath that gets so, it on there. Al, we're, we're getting close to wrap time, but I, I want to talk about something important. We've been talking all about uh, self-defense and yeah. fighting with a knife. and and and. Uh, but on your Instagram page, you feature a lot of videos that are, uh, you know, they're, they're horrible to look at, but you got to yeah. look at them if you're interested in this kind of stuff or you carry a knife for self-defense. How quickly can things escalate? How bad can things get when a knife is produced in a street fight? It's so fast. It's... Because it, here's what happens when, when people, um, they see, they haven't really seen violence in person. I've seen a lot and it, you got to get used to it. So when I started bouncing before all this, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I would pace back and forth and they used to call me the tiger. You know, a tiger goes in the cage because mm -hmm. I was like, man, I'm ready for anything. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. And I'm like, okay. So after a while, uh, I'd just be standing at the door and I'd be waiting because I know what's going to happen because I made it happen. I am the one that control everything. The feeder concept of say, I'm the feeder. I'm not the receiver. Okay. And once you get that mindset, it, it changes your whole perspective. But as far as knives come out in a second, and, and then all of a sudden you have to come up with a defense because you let it get that far. You need to be the one with the blade, the one that's aware. You need to be first. You need to know. How many times you think that it's just all of a sudden there's somebody there with a knife? It really doesn't happen that much. But it happens to people that aren't paying attention all of a sudden. And I showed these videos, and they're brutally violent because you have to know. If people don't know that this goes on, they just walk around and something. This guy's crazy. He's over the top. No, this doesn't happen. It's like the government telling you, you know, believe this. They they would never do that. Not in my neighborhood. Well, guess what? This is everybody's neighborhood. This is how fast it happens. You have to be aware. Awareness of what's going on around you is the key. And to be able to focus on being the feeder, going first. No defenses for suckers. You can't block everything at all. It's like being a goalie in a hockey thing. If you're only on defense, but you're going to let some are going to get through. There's no way. You have to be the shooter. You miss with all the punches you don't throw. You miss with all the blade cuts you don't do. If you just sit there and wait, because it only takes one with the blade. Yeah. It only You miss one, and there then... Yeah, things go downhill. There was one video on your Instagram feed that that really struck me. It was a, a guy uh, fighting another guy with a knife. The, the the guy who was unarmed seemed to have a lot of respect and was, you know, he obviously was a fighter, but was right. respecting the knife. Another guy just strolls up like, hey, and no. he got hit in the neck and he was right. on the ground, oh, let yeah. out in, oh, yeah, in an instant. Out, yeah. Uh, it was terrible to see. I mean, those, those those kind of videos, I don't know what the situation is. I'm sure they're all bad people, but yeah. it's still terrible to see. It's another person, but how quickly. Oh, I'm made of the same stuff, and right. all you got to do is hit me in the same place, and I'm done. You're done. Um, so uh, like as we time. wrap here, as yeah. we wrap here, like uh, give give the listeners some sort of concept of how they should respect other crazy people and, and the knife. Okay, so... When you're around crazy people, you, you should know that something's going to happen here in a little bit. We all have our instincts that uh, spider sense, right? The moon, there's something. I should not be here. Let's go. Forget the we're going to make a stand. You don't have to make a stand, especially if you're unarmed. You you are in the, you're not in a good place because you can't stop somebody that just all of a sudden has a knife starts charging you. Okay, will that happen? Don't know. But for the person that it happens to, yeah, it happened to him. And then they just stand there and watch you. 
So the more you're accustomed of being aware when you go out, look at who's carrying knives when you go out. I've been carrying an open blade lately because when I'm out, I see people in the stores. I mean, this dude's carrying an open blade right now. Okay, things are changing. Now, when I see him, whether he has a, a blade on his hip, I'm like, okay, so now i got to give him a little more respect. And then I put one in there when they see me. Oh, okay, maybe I might not mess with this dude. I, I have to make people want to not do things to me instead mm -hmm. of trying to manipulate them while they're doing it. So I have to have my helmet on. i got to be ready. Here's a blade right here. You have to decide that that's a bad idea, what I'm about to do to this guy, because I'm probably going to get stabbed. OK, I want you to see the blade. I'm going to show it to you and then it's going to be gone because you're going to know that. OK, this is not really what I'm bargaining for. They go to the path of least resistance. Anybody that's going to rob you, they go to the easy one. They don't go to the hard ones. If you look like or give the impression that this is not going to be as easy as I thought, they will just move on. So my thing is like make them quit even before they want to get over to you. Yeah. Okay. Be ready. Show that pistol handle if you carry a gun. Show them the place you me. I got that guy's probably armed. I don't want to do this. So that's how the perception is everything, right? That old saying. Yeah. How I'm perceived is everything. If I'm perceived, I'm putting on my phone. I'm doing. Oh well, then that guy's pretty easy hit right there. And it happens all the time. I mean, the wheel is spinning. It just hasn't stopped on you yet. And when it stops on you, you let's be prepared for it. Uh, okay? But I don't have a martial art to dedicate my life to. I don't have that time anymore. That's why the blade, that's why all these blades came into existence. Okay. There's no time to train. Let's face it. I got you. The guy's got two kids. He's got this. Okay. It takes five minutes to learn. Let's just slug it up. I mean, very easy. Okay. Beautiful. So, that's my yeah. advice. Al, thank you so much for joining well, us on the Knife Junkie podcast. Not only you. are your knives like really, really cool and intuitive and uh, useful, uh, but but your experience, uh, especially for those of us who haven't had all that experience, right. it's really, really great to hear. So thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Take care, yeah. sir. Thank you. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Al Salviti of Regiment Blades and so much experience in uh, in knife fighting and training. Uh, I can't wait to talk to him more. If you're a patron, you can listen to more of this conversation coming up. Uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and of course, join us on Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.